What would happen if you fell overboard? I was actually disappearing behind waves. So they'd get a glimpse of me as I went up and down in the swell. What are the chances of retrieving your boat? The boat actually did over 130 miles on its own. And what lessons can we learn from this experience? I'm still getting over it. I'm not sure I ever will, I don't know. It's gonna take a long time. This is part two in our Man Overboard feature. Find out how Nige was rescued, and more importantly, what happened to his boat with his cat Stinky on board. Keep watching to find out how you can get your hands on a free Spinlock life jacket, a free Ocean Signal personal locator beacon, and 15% discount on Predict Wind. In part one, we were talking to Nigel Fox about the time he fell off his boat into two metre swells in the dangerous seas off northern Australia. We left him in the water as his boat disappeared over the horizon with his cat Stinky on board. So it was just him in the water, two metre swells and quite a few tiger sharks hanging around. Mm. Okay, so before we look at the practicalities of what saved Nigel, let's just have a quick reminder of his state of mind at the time. Nine tenths of the battle being out there in the brine is psychological as well as physical. No bad thoughts, no bad thoughts allowed. Going in the water is only half of it. It's uh, up here. That's your main defense. That's what keeps you alive. That psychological defense mechanism is absolutely crucial to your chance of survival in a situation like this. And Nigel was really well prepared. He was wearing a spin lock life vest with integral hood. And that meant he didn't have to worry too much about any kind of problem from a secondary drowning and spray. He also had other precautions. Yeah, I mean, one of the main precautions he took, of course, was to have his Iridium Go set up, running the Predict Wind app that was sending his boat's location to his friends every hour. And more importantly, of course, he had his PLB, which was uh, giving away his position in the water. Well, from a search and rescue perspective, what was interesting uh, about this was the safety precautions that the male took that ultimately saved his life. He was tethered to his yacht. He was wearing a life jacket with a personal locator beacon. And this enabled us to, to tailor a search and rescue response and uh, ultimately save his life. What's going to happen? They're going to call Ian up, which they did. They phoned Ian. Fortunately, because of the tracker of the Iridium, he actually gave them the land along the boat, speed, course bearing, etc. They tried the sat phone anyway, yet no answer. So they knew where the boat was, where it was going. My PLB is registered as a separate item. He's doing two and a half knots in this direction. So that they knew I was in the water. So in terms of search and rescue, Nigel was doing pretty well. They knew that his boat was going one way and he was going the other way. Of course, that's all very well, but if he's in the water and he's got other things to worry about. He doesn't know if anyone has picked up those signals. He's concentrating more on sculling in shark infested mm. waters. When I was chatting to him, he mentioned a funny thing. He said he was glad that he wasn't wearing a watch. Every 30 seconds, I'd have been looking at it. And psychologically, that would have been a real downer. And I would say, if you do end up in that situation, you've got to watch on, take it off, put it in the pocket, but you can't see it. The single most important thing in this whole experience, of course, was the personal beacon on you. Tell us a bit more about that and, and how that was important to you, not just in terms of actually being rescued, but also that must have had some kind of psychological, mental reassurance, knowing that that had been set off and that people could track you as opposed to the boat. What is packed into that little thing? 66 channel GPS, EPUB and 121.5. So you're the 121.5 to your aircraft. That's in that little bundle there. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. Keep watching because we're giving away an Ocean Signal PLB-1, the same model that saved Nige's life. Such an amazing amount of technology wrapped up in that tiny little holder. It really must have given Nige quite a lot of self-confidence to know that that was working, hopefully. Can you let us know uh, exactly how it does work and what's in it? Well, quite simply, it's uh, a personal EPIRB. So everyone carries an EPIRB on their boat. Well, this is a an EPIRB for your, your person as opposed oh. to the boat, and it works in the same way. Now, it is slightly different, well, it's quite different to a man overboard AIS unit. We will be talking more about that in a little bit. But the EPIRB and the personal locator beacon works on the 406 megahertz signal, which uses the global COSPAS SARSAT rescue system. So this is a 
standard for all 406 beacons, all beacons that use the 406 megahertz, and it's supported by a network that covers the globe and alerts emergency services in your local region. They also transmit on a secondary frequency, which I mentioned, the 121.5 megahertz, and this is used by rescue lifeboats and by planes as well. And we don't have those, do we? God, we really have have, yep. have to it's got to be it. it's got to be top of our shopping list yeah. now for sure with the plb now activated the australian maritime safety authority or amsa for short could now start scrambling a plane for his rescue now amsa covers a huge area 10 percent of the world's surface believe it or not <laughs> and I, I looked at the map of their coverage that they, they even cover us up here in borneo good old australia <laughs> yes so what was the time frame from falling in the water to first seeing the plane? Four or five hours? Well, considering how remote I actually was, and I'm a lot, when I was a long way from anywhere and anything, not bad. Time actually went fairly quickly for me before the aeroplane arrived. But if I had my VHF jammed lost, the first time when that jet flew over, I could like, boom, straight on the radio, called them up. So I actually did get to meet the crew. They said I was actually disappearing behind waves. So they'd get a glimpse of me as I went up and down in the swell. But I mean, electronically they knew where I was, but it was actually getting a visual, you know, eyes on. Yeah. And that for them was actually quite difficult. That footage was taken from the plane, the actual plane that was looking for Nige at the time. Don't forget, it was doing 300 kilometres per hour. So it really was like looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. We task our, our Challenger rescue jet out of Cairns that arrived on location a couple of hours later. We also task a Northern Territory Marine Unit, Northern Territory Police Marine Unit out of Gove. AMSA commissioned six Challenger jets from Cobham Aviation Services who have hubs that cover all over Australia. Each jet is fitted with a search camera system called VIDAR. This visual detection technology is specifically used to find life rafts and people lost at sea. It is the world's first optical radar developed in Australia by Sentient Vision and detects different colours and shapes against the background of the water. And it was thanks to Nige's bright jacket that they were able to locate him. Even so, they explained that he was a single pixel on the screen, disappearing behind waves as Nige just mentioned. At this point, he was already many miles from his yacht, and the closest town was the remote port of Nulamboy off the Gove Peninsula, 93 kilometres away. Things are now out of Nige's hands. All he has to do is concentrate on sculling in the water, avoiding tiger sharks <laughs> and secondary drowning. Meanwhile, the AMSA jet did a series of flybys from different angles. This was to build a map of prevailing winds, sea state and the effects of the current in order to drop a life raft. Aboard the plane was aircraft mission coordinator Ollie Marin, who explained how difficult this part of the mission was. A successful drop and an unsuccessful drop is separated only by a matter of three to four seconds. Ollie was at the back of the aircraft um, with the three screens in front of him. He's on comms to the girl at the back. So they've opened up the rest, they opened up a hatch to the uh, back of the aeroplane. She hoofs out the raft and the line. They've got to get all of this timing absolutely down pat. They normally drop about 400 meters a line and they try to make you the target in roughly the middle of it. And you just see this line coming out the back of the aeroplane. And that line landed within two meters of me. Wow. And it was like, couple of strokes, grabbed it. It doesn't matter how big and tough and strong you think your arms are. When you've pulled yourself through the water for several hundred meters, well, my arms are knackered. If you are familiar with our channel, you may remember a few years ago, we launched our old life raft in a swimming pool, donned our oilies and practiced getting into it. It was surprisingly difficult, even in a flat swimming pool, and we weren't wearing life jackets. So you can imagine how much more difficult this is after a traumatic ordeal and in the open sea. Fortunately, AMSA's life rafts are equipped with platforms and with ladders, but that wasn't the problem. In this case, Nigel's having a problem with his life jacket. When you get to the raft, you can actually climb up, get your knees on it, pull yourself in. But as I actually found, when you get to the raft, with the thickness of the infl fully inflated life jacket, it's actually quite an impediment to getting in. I knew if I deflated it, I'd have very little air in it to keep me afloat. So that was basically what I did. I deflated the life jacket. 
Of course, deflating his life jacket meant that Nige lost his flotation. Uh, so it must have been quite a big deal to have made that decision. Don't forget, of course, he was doing this also with two broken ribs. Now, when we did our practice in the swimming pool, we weren't wearing life jackets. So it wouldn't have occurred to us to deflate it. So this is why it's so good to chat to Nige. Little tips, little bits of information like that are very useful. Something else that he mentioned was he was talking to a female sailor and she said that busty women have even more of a problem. They're like Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex. <laughs> so deflating the life jacket, uh, especially for women, is important. And what he recommended was if there are more than one of you, the men should get on first mm. and then assist the women. OK, well, that is a very useful tip. In the base of the life raft, there was this really thick yellow PVC mat that had pouches in it. Fortunately, with big print, they said, food, water, radio. Right, I've gone to the radio, got the radio out, turned it on, spoke to Ollie in the aircraft, told them I'm safe, and then that, they've gone, cool. Then they can go off and actually get fuel. But I didn't realize this at the time. They've actually gone to get fuel, and uh, this other aircraft is circling me to let me know that somebody is actually knows I'm actually there. There was a police boat on its way, but he wasn't going to be with me for another three to four hours. So I was like, OK, lay down and have a sleep. And can you believe it? He did actually get some sleep. Mind you, he must have been completely knackered by then. Yeah. Uh, Nigel, when I spoke to him, has some funny anecdotes about those four or five hours he spent in the life raft. Uh, the first thing that he did was he found a glow stick, a fluorescent glow stick, accidentally knelt on it, broke it and covered himself all over in fluorescent yellow paint. And in fact, if you look at the body cam footage of his eventual rescue from the life raft, as he's being dragged over the side, you can see he's covered in yellow. The other funny thing he did was he was looking for something to eat and he found a packet of granules mm. and he thought, oh, emergency rations and tucked into them before he realized it was actually sea dye. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Sea, sea dye is what you throw <laughs> out the back of the life raft, which of course leaves a great big fluorescent trail yeah. in the water so that aircraft can see it. <laughs> he started eating this. <laughs> I can see his teeth from a thousand miles. <laughs> Apparently when he again when he was rescued by the police boat he was covered in fluorescent paint. We went down the pub with them afterwards and after we had a few beers they presented me with a um, packet of seed I either chew on should I get the munchies later. <laughs> it took the boat five hours to reach him and he had drifted more than 20 miles from his man overboard location. It then took them seven hours to return to Nulemboy, and he was greeted by the ambulance service and taken to hospital. Fortunately, his only injuries were two broken ribs. I think at this point, we should look at some lessons learned. Let's examine the gear that saved Nigel's life. You'll find links in the description to all the gear that we're going to discuss now. Nigel's wearing a Spinlock life jacket. We recommend the Spinlock Deck Vest 60, which is a fully featured lightweight front opening life jacket harness with automatic inflation. It also includes a large clear spray hood, something that Nige benefited from. Uh, but even with the hood, Nige did ingest quite a bit of salt water. And in fact, he lost his voice for five days after the experience. But he does say without that spray hood, he probably would have drowned. The vest also features a single wide leg strap. It has a light and it can be fitted with Spinlock's HRS system. They've been working on it for some time now. And the idea is, is that it's something that you can easily release yourself from the jack line were you to go overboard. You'll also notice the D6 has a number of loops for you to connect the other gear we're going to discuss in a moment. Always carry a knife, but make sure it's safe by having one with a curved end. I think we might get some hook knives as well. They're mm. quite useful little things to have clipped onto you, permanently onto your life vest. Try to have a handheld VHF with you. Waterproof, obviously. It's going to be really useful if an aircraft or a vessel comes to your aid. Perhaps the single most important piece of equipment you're going to have on you if you're in the water, so that's certainly the case from Nigel's experience. We do recommend an article by Yachting Monthly. They published one earlier this year and they looked at the best PLBs on the market as well as man overboard AIS units as well. We've got a link in the description to that article. 
These are different to a personal locator beacon. They are using AIS instead of the 406 megahertz frequency. Of course, this will allow you to be seen by other vessels in the vicinity. In Nigel's case, unfortunately, he hadn't seen a boat for days, so they're only of any use if you are in a busy area. Who knows what a heliograph is? Well, basically, it's a mirror. That's all it is, a reflective surface for you to catch the attention of a pilot of a boat or of a plane. Have one on you. Most of you are familiar with the Iridium Go, which we use for weather forecasting when we're offshore, as well as simple communication with family and friends. Now, Predict Wind offers the most comprehensive weather package available to mariners. From forecast tables, wind, wave, gust, cloud, isobar, air temperature, sea temperature maps, I mean, the list is endless. Now, the thing with Predict Wind is if you buy a SIM card and a data package through them, they set up a free tracking service on a map, which you can embed in a website, and allows your family and friends to monitor the movement of the boat, and it gets updated every hour. This was essential to the recovery of Nigel's boat, which we're about to find out about in a moment. And now here's how you can grab a free Spinlock 60 life vest and an Ocean Signal PLB1. All you've got to do is put a comment below this video. We will choose our two favourite comments. What you need to do is add a hashtag to your comment, either hashtag Ocean Signal or hashtag Spinlock HQ, to make sure that your comment counts. There are no rules, we're just going to choose our favourite two. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And Predict Wind is offering a fantastic 15% discount off any weather package purchased through their website, predictwind.com. All you have to do is add the code follow the boat to your purchase. Details are in the description. These fantastic offers run until the 25th of July and they are exclusive to follow the boat YouTube viewers. So big, big thanks to Spinlock, to Ocean Signal and to Predict Wind. So what did happen to Nigel's boat? And more importantly, where and what happened to Stinky? Because I said earlier, when I set the bearing wrong and the yacht went past Truett, the yacht buggered off on its own. And friends of mine here in Nullumboy, because they had access to the tracker on Protect Winds, they could see where the boat was going. The boat actually did over 130 miles on its own. And literally the contents of the boat was on the floor. I don't know what the boat went through on the way, but it must've gone through some fairly rough weather. But when the guys actually got to the boat, and they said it was dead flat and they, they've stepped on board and they could see the cut jack line over the side. They found the knife in the cockpit where I chucked it in. And then they looked inside and they said the boat was just trashed. Mm. Everything was on the floor and they've literally had to use a boat hook to lift stuff out of the way so they could get in. And then of course they've heard the cat at the front. They've gone up, given her some water, some food. She was not happy. But once they fed her and she'd had a drink, she kind of settled back down. And by the time they got back here and on the anchor, she was as good as gold. So Stinky and Bison live to sail another day. Hooray! Nigel wanted us to make sure that we do let everyone know that it was Andrew and David, his great friends, who rescued Stinky, found Bison and sailed her safely home to shore. So we should at this point just thank Nigel very much for being so open with us and allowing us to probe him with lots of questions yeah. so that we can draw some lessons from, yes. from his experience. I've got to say I learned a lot from uh, your conversation with him. It's been really, really interesting. There's a lot of stuff we need to buy. There certainly is, yeah. And also thank you to AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, and of course to the Northern Territories Police Force who eventually saved Nigel. Cheers, guys. Very important that um, people do buy and register their PLBs or their EPIRBs, et cetera. Because if you are out there and something goes wrong, A, they need to know who to call. And if you're a reliable contact person, like it might be Mikey out in the boat, but he's got his mate John Owen and Davo with him, then rescue authorities know they're not just looking for one person, they're looking for free. Get it in, get it registered, because that makes your life so much easier for the search and rescue crews.